Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Benjamin Crosby, and with my co-counsel, Mr. Caleb Knox. Good morning, Your Honor. We represent the prosecution, the United States. Francis on the defense. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Camille Schaefer. Today I'm joined by my co-counsel, Michael Blaine. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Together we represent the defendant in today's case, Avni Shah. And then for our judges, then you'll select on your ballot, Crosby v. Schaefer. Any housekeeping? Yes, Your Honor, a few matters. Uh, there's a binder in front of Your Honor. If I could direct your attention to page three of that binder, under what's called stipulations. I'm going to read stipulation eight. The parties have statements from Debsky, Moeller, Falkenstein, and Owens, which are marked as exhibits three through six, respectively. For any of those witnesses who do not testify at trial, which would be all four in today's trial, the parties agree that their statement is admissible without objection. Your Honor, we'd just like to enter those at this time, pursuant to that stipulation. Okay. That's our understanding. All right, we'll enter them once the record is open. And one more thing, Your Honor. Under stipulation 9, the parties agree that the cellular evidence referenced in Exhibit 4 is accurate, and that any witness familiar with Exhibit 4 may testify to cellular evidence. We just wanted to make that aware, uh, Your Honor, aware of that stipulation as well. Thank you. Finally, Your Honor, we'd like to invoke Rule 603 and 615 which call for the constructive swearing in and constructive sequestration, bless you, of all witnesses barring party representatives. And do you have any party representatives? We do not, Your Honor. All right, granted, do you have any party representatives? No party representative, but Augie Shepard will be constructively present through this trial. Of course. With that, Your Honor, the prosecution is ready to go. Anything from the defense? No, Your Honor, we're ready as well. All right, we'll start with opening statements. Yes, Your Honor. He was a made man, first by choice, then by chance. Tom Klein was a travel agent. He worked a simple job in Los Angeles. He had a wife and dog, friends and neighbors. He lived a quiet, hidden life, tucked away in Santa Monica. But on June 26, 2021, in the early morning, Tom Klein heard a noise outside. He opened his front door. He stepped out to investigate. Within seconds, someone came up from behind Tom Klein, put jumper cables around his neck, and choked him to death. They didn't raid his house or break his window. They didn't take his wallet or steal his car. They killed him and left the jumper cables next to the body in the drive. And this execution of a simple travel agent just doesn't make sense. Unless you understand who Tom Klein really was. You see, Tom Klein's real name was Barry Capello. And Barry Capello, members of the jury, was a made man. First by choice, then by chance. You see, Barry Capello was a member, once upon a time, of the DeBruno crime family of Pennsylvania. But Barry wasn't just any member of the mob. He was what's called a made man. 
that that's someone who's initiated into the monk, who swears loyalty, takes an oath to the monk. Larry wrote that in 2018. By testifying against the mob, but worse still, he named names. None more important than the name of the person who ran the crime enterprise. He named Augie Shepard, the defendant in this case. So Barry went to hide. He had to go into witness protection. He became Tom Clum. Three years later, Barry Capellum was made again but this time in a very different way. You see, in June 2021, Augie Shepard took a chance trip to LA, where Tom Klein lived. By chance, Augie Shepard happened to walk by the office where Tom Klein worked. The defendant locked eyes with the man who had testified against him. By chance, Barry's cover had been blown. By chance, he was named. So again, he immediately called the marshal responsible for his protection, but it was too late. Within 12 hours, Barry Capello's body was lying in his driveway. That's why we've charged this defendant with murder and retaliation against the witness. And what that means is that we as the prosecution have to prove a couple of things. Uh, namely, two. First, that the defendant was responsible for the death of Barry Capello. And second, that that death was caused intentionally, with malice of forethought. But more specifically, that the reason Barry was killed was in retaliation against his prior testimony. And we have to prove both of those things to you beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's what we'll do. But today, you're going to hear the testimony from U.S. Deputy Marshal Connor Wright. And when Mr. Wright takes the stand, we expect you'll hear that the murder of Barry Capello fits the profile of a mob killer. We expect you'll see the evidence at the scene. Evidence of a dark sports car seen by an eyewitness at the scene that matches the car the defendant was driving. Jumper cables that should have been in that car but weren't. Jumper cables of the same color and same brand as the ones found at the scene. Shoe prints matching the same size and the weight of the defendant. We expect that you'll hear the totality of the circumstances arranged against this defendant. None more critical than the fact that he has no alibi. Members of the jury, Gary Capello was a made man. First by choice, then by chance, and that's what got him. That's why at the end of this trial, I'll come back before you and ask that you find the defendant. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Opening from the defense? Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> may I proceed? You may. This case comes down to un- Answer questions. What if I told you that Augie Shepard never even saw Barry Capello that day? What if I told you Augie Shepard had no way of locating where Mr. Capello was that night? What if I told you that the whole trip to LA? It's just a father-daughter road trip. Would that change things? The fact is, Augie Shepard was in Los Angeles on June 25th. But that fact alone is not enough to prove him guilty of murder. There are several questions the government won't be able to answer today about that weekend. And that's a problem. Because in this trial, as the defense, we don't have a burden of proof. We don't have to answer those questions. The burden lies solely with the government today. They have to prove every element of every charge they brought beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the highest burden in our legal system. It means they have to bring you enough evidence to leave you so convinced that you have a moral certainty. Bobby Shepard is guilty. 
government will fail to meet that burden. Because this case comes down to unanswered questions. Let's take them one more. So first, did Augie Shepard even see Mary Capella that day? Now, Mr. Crosby just got up here and told you the story of this alleged sighting. They said Mr. Shepard saw Mr. Capello, and that was the moment he decided to retaliate. That's a great story. But the evidence won't support it today. Because instead, you'll meet Lauren Shepard, Mr. Shepard's daughter. She's going to take the stand, and she'll describe for you the moment of this alleged sighting. And members of the jury, it's going to be boring. Because nothing happened. Mr. Shepard didn't look angry. He didn't look upset. He didn't so much as look through the window. Instead, you'll learn he took his daughter to get ice cream. Which brings us to the second unanswered question. Even if Mr. Shepard did see Mr. Capello through that window that day, how did he find him that night? Mr. Crosby told you about Deputy Marshall Wright, who's going to testify, and we'll expect him to describe for you today how at the time of his death, Mr. Capello was in the witness protection program. What that meant is no one could access his identity, let alone where he lived. You're also going to learn no evidence that Mr. Shepard ever made an effort to find out where Mr. Capello lived. No text messages, no calls, no emails, no Google Maps search history. members of the jury, today's trial is the one opportunity the government has to bring you that evidence. This is their one shot to bring you every piece of evidence, every witness to testify, to prove every element of every charge beyond a reasonable doubt. But the evidence will show this case comes down to unanswered questions. That's why at the end of this trial, I'll come before you once more. I'll remind you of the evidence missing. And I'll ask that you find Dr. Shepard not guilty. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, the record's now open. I will admit the exhibits you discussed with me in pretrial and the uh, government you can call your first witness. Yes, sure. Prosecution calls Deputy Marshal Connor Wright to stand. Sir, would you introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Sure. My name is Connor Wright. Mr. Wright, what is it that you do for a living? I'm currently a deputy marshal with the U.S. Marshal Service. Can you tell us what that means? Sure. I'm currently responsible for witness protection and criminal investigation. Mr. Wright, what brings you to court today? I was responsible for the relocation of a man named Barry Capella and the investigation of his death in 2020. Sir, could you tell us why Mr. Capello was under your protection in the Witness Protection Program? Of course. In 2018, Mr. Capello testified against a member of the DeBruno crime family, a notorious family based in Pennsylvania. After that, he had to relocate him for his protection. Could you explain to us the nature of the testimony that Mr. Capello gave? Of course. He testified against one of the captains in that crime family, and implicated the name of the mob boss, Augie Shepard. Did you ever find out the nature of Mr. Capello's role in the DeBruno crime family? I did. Our investigation found that Mr. Capello was one of the captains. What exactly was Mr. Capello responsible for? Was he always in the mob, or was he initiated? Mr. Capello was what we call a made man. As crime families require people to swear an oath, often they require them to commit a crime to be confirmed for us. After providing this testimony to law enforcement, where was Mr. Capello placed? We moved Mr. Capello to Los Angeles. How long did he live in Los Angeles? We moved him there in 2018, so about three years. 
So during those three years, did you ever hear anything that would indicate that Mr. Capello's life could be in danger? No. You mentioned that Mr. Capello died in 2021. When specifically did he die? On June 26, 2021. Do you know how? Autopsy found strangulation. Sir, when you found out that Mr. Capello had died through strangulation, were you able to talk to anybody who may have seen what happened? I did. Uh, I spoke with one of Mr. Capello's neighbors, Melanie Dempsey. What did Miss Dempsey say happened that night? Miss Dempsey reported seeing someone come up behind Mr. Capello, strangle him with jumper cables, and then drive off in a dark space car. When you heard that story and as you proceeded with your investigation, were you able to focus on any primary suspects in this case? I was. We investigated Augie Shepard. Mr. Wright, what made you focus on Augie Shepard in this case? First of all, Augie Shepard was implicated by Mr. Capello's testimony in that 2018 trial. Mr. Shepard was named as the crime boss. Additionally, we found evidence that Mr. Shepard was in Los Angeles on the day that Mr. Capello died. Do you know where in Los Angeles Mr. Shepard spent his time that day? I do. Would you recognize a copy of a couple of receipts that you reviewed if I were to show them to you? I'm sure I would. Mr. Wright, if you take the binder that's sitting right next to you there and flip, it's going to be marked as Exhibits 15 and 16, sort of towards the back there. I'm there. Sir, could you tell me what we're looking at here, 15 and 16? Of course. Exhibit 15 is a receipt from an Italian restaurant on June 25th, 2021. And Exhibit 16 is a receipt from an ice cream place. Whose signature is at the bottom of those two receipts? Augie Shepard. Do these look to have been changed or altered in any way? No. Your Honor, we offer to this 15 and 16 minutes. Any objection? We have no objection. They'll be admitted. Sir, what's important to you, if anything, about these two receipts? The thing that stood out to me in particular was the proximity in time. The receipt from the Italian restaurant was 12.47 p.m., and the receipt from that ice cream place was at 12.52, just five minutes apart. Are there any buildings in between these two, the restaurant and the ice cream place? That's correct. There's a travel agency run by Palm Flying. That was the alias we gave to Mr. Capello. Mr. Wright, do you know if between 12.47 p.m. and 12.52 p.m., Mr. Shepard and Mr. Capello may have interacted? We found evidence of that. But what evidence did you find? Mr. Capello called me that day at 12.50 and left a voicemail on my office. Would you recognize that voicemail? I'm sure I would. Sir, if you flip maybe just two pages back to exhibit 14, I'm there. What is this? This is a transcript of that voicemail Mr. Capello left me. Does it look to be the same as you remember hearing it? It does. We offer exhibit 14 in that. Objection here, sir. Response? Yes, Your Honor. Under Rule 803.1, this fits an exception to hearsay. It's a present sense impression. Response? Yes, Your Honor. We actually have evidence in this case that the declarant, Barry Capello, called his wife before leaving this voicemail. Now, that phone call, it disrupts the timeline and allows for a period of reflection that therefore undermines the exception of present sense impression. This exception doesn't apply. Response? Yes, Your Honor. The presence of, of another call would not disrupt what's required by 8031, which is just that the impression must be made directly after the, 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 clear, the, I'm sorry, the declarant proceeded. If I may draw Your Honor's attention to this document, mm -hmm. And if I make an offer of proof. You may. In this document, it simply says, I think they found me. Augie Shepard just walked by my office window, and we made eye contact. And Your Honor, we've just spent a minute or so laying the foundation for how this is a couple minute section of time after the defendant would have walked by the window that the victim made this phone call. It's well within the windows of the Do you dispute the fact that there was a phone call placed between uh, the perceived event and the statement being made? We haven't heard that evidence yet, Your Honor. Our, our contention is that if that evidence comes in, it wouldn't mean that this doesn't take 803. But we sure, haven't heard that. Sure, sure. I understand that we haven't heard it yet, but we're, we're talking about admissibility right now. Do you dispute the fact that there was a phone call made before this one? 
Uh, I, I'm not aware of that phone call, Your Honor, which is the only reason I'm saying that. Sure. But we're not saying that it didn't exist. We're just saying we're not aware of that. Okay. Uh, response? Yes, Your Honor. Under Rule 104A, we're allowed to rely on inadmissible evidence, that other phone call, to determine the admissibility of this evidence. And the text of 8031, the hearsay exception Mr. Crosby is citing, is very specific. It says that the statement must be made made well or immediately after the declarant perceived it. Now, this phone call to his wife, before this statement disrupts that, it is not made while, it is not made immediately after. Present sense impression, that exception, it protects hearsay because it can't allow for that stage of reflection to take place. That's not the case here. This exception doesn't apply. What have you heard? <laughs> if that's all right. Sure. A, a couple of things. One, again, we're not aware of a phone call prior to 12.50 p.m. made by this witness on this same subject. However, if such a phone call did exist, and if Mr. Capello made a phone call to his wife about this very same thing, and then made a phone call again about the same event that he had just perceived, that would not go against Rule 8031. And the Schaefer just read specifically the text of that Rule 8031, which indicates that. Okay, I have one question for defense counsel, and then I'll roll. Can you proffer the phone call where I can find that?
Sir, I'd like to take a look at a forensic report. Would you flip to Exhibit 4? And, and Your Honor, in pretrial, this was pre-admitted. Thank you. I'm back. Sir, are you familiar with that forensic report? I am. I reviewed this as part of my test. Does that forensic report tell us anything about the physical evidence you just mentioned? It does. It tells us that the shoe prints left outside of Mr. Capella's house on the night he died were size 11, and that the person who made them weighed between 170 and 190 pounds. How much does the victim, Barry Capella, weigh? Or how much did he weigh that? About 230 pounds. Do you know how much Augie Shepard, the defendant, weighs? 180 What size shoes does the defendant, Augie Shepard, wear? Size 11. Thank you, Nassir. Thank you. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Briefly, Your Honor. Sure. 
Mr. Wright, in your professional capacity, are you able to make it impossible to find the home address of a person you place? Unfortunately, we are. As marshals, we do our best, but it's always possible that if the witness does something, their identity gets compromised. Thank you, sir. Nothing further. Right. Uh, barring any recross, may Mr. Wright step down? Absolutely. Do you have any recross? None. All right. And does the state have anything further? No, Your Honor. We rest our case in chief. Right, state rest. One moment, please. I'm getting a message from our tournament director. Tournament director would like me to, uh, we'll take a five minute recess to let you all know that we should all be masking. My apologies. So we'll take five and when we come back, we will all look the same. <laughs> Shepard, do you happen to know how your father felt 
felt about your Uncle Barry testifying against your cousin? It was something. You know, Uncle Barry was someone we considered close to the family, so he was pretty upset about it. Uh, he called Uncle Barry a rat and said that he was dead to him. But, Miss Shepard, did you ever happen to hear your father say anything about becoming violent towards Uncle Barry? <coughs> Never anything like that. I'm just upset that he has to work. Well, I'd like to make a timeline of June 25th, 2021. Miss Shepard, what was the plan for that day? Well, my dad and I planned on going on tour at UCLA. Uh, so we got lunch for during the day, went on the tour, came back to our hotel, and went out for dinner. Well, I'd like to break that down a little bit. When did you first arrive in Los Angeles? Uh, we arrived a couple days earlier. So what did you do in the morning <coughs> of June 25th? Um, we had a hotel, got breakfast, and then we headed out for lunch around. Where did you go for lunch? Uh, we went to a little Italian place, uh, not too far from campus. What did you do after lunch? After lunch, we walked to get some ice cream. And what happened after ice cream? After ice cream, we headed back to UCLA, went on tour for a couple hours, uh, headed back to our hotel, and then we went out for dinner. Ma'am, after dinner with your dad, did you come back to the hotel at all? No, we did. You got ready for bed and we had to sleep. About what time was it when you got back to the hotel? Uh, around 10. And did you stay at the hotel that whole night? No. Uh, one of my friends, she was a freshman at UCLA, invited me out to a party. Um, I'd never been to a college party before, so I decided to go out there. So about what time did you leave for that party? around the lunch one. And about what time did you come back from the party? Around 3-ish. Miss Shepard, between 11.30 or besides 11.30 and 3 a.m. that morning, were you ever apart from your father? No, we did everything together for pretty much the rest of that day. And when you left at 11.30, what was your father doing? He was asleep. Objection, Your Honor, to speculation. May I be heard? You may. Your Honor, this witness can testify to the things she observed her father doing or the way he was behaving, but to say that he <coughs> was in fact asleep, that goes too far. Ms. Um, anyway, I asked her at that time that you were present, what was your father doing? She testified to what she saw him doing. There's no speculation. I'm not asking her to step into the mindset of her father. Yeah, be heard, Your Honor. Anyway. Your Honor, this would be a slight difference between saying he seemed like he was asleep, his eyes were closed, he wasn't moving, versus saying he was asleep. But there is a big speculative difference there because one does require her to look into the mind of her father or to see his state of consciousness. I'm going to let you cross-examine on that. No will be objection. Yes, yeah, sure. So, Ms. Shepard, I'll re-ask my question. At 11.30 p.m., what was your father doing? He looked like he was asleep. And at 3 a.m. when you got back, what was your father doing? He looked like he was asleep. Ma'am, when you left at 11.30, did you tell your father when you'd be coming back that morning? No, I, I snuck out. I didn't want him to know I was going to the party. At any point when you did sneak out and you were at that party, did you get an angry text or phone call from your father asking, where are you? No, he didn't contact me at all. Right, well, I'd like to narrow in on one moment. You might not think it's important, but when you were at lunch in that ice cream shop that afternoon, do you remember passing a place called Klein Travel? Yeah, it was right between where the restaurant went for lunch was and where we got ice cream. Well, Ms. Shepard, when you passed Klein Travel with your dad, did you see him look angry? No, he seemed perfectly fine. Did you see him look shocked? No, not at all. Did you see your father react at all? No. When you asked Klein Travel, he seemed normal. All right, well, did you see your father stop in front of Klein Travel? No, not at all. Ms. Shepard, did you see your father so much as look through the windows of Klein Trump? From what I can tell, no. So what did your father do when you and him passed Klein Travel that day? He kept walking, meeting, and he got some ice cream. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Your Honor, we have nothing further. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor.
permission to proceed? You may. Good morning, Ms. Shepard. My name is Benjamin Crosby. I have a few questions for you on behalf of the state. <clears throat> Sounds good. Ms. Shepard, I, I want to start by getting one thing very clear for the members of our jury. Between the hours of 11.30 p.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning of June 26, 2021, you were not with your mom. No, like I said, I was at party. In that window of time, you do not know where he was. No, I can't tell you exactly where he was, but from what I saw, it seemed like he's getting off. In that window of time, you do not know what your father did. No, I can't tell you. That wasn't me. Now, initially, you told investigators you were with your father during that period of time, didn't you? Uh, initially, what I told them was that we've been together the entire day and that we went to sleep at the same time. Um, I was a bit embarrassed and not sneaking out and couldn't really get in trouble. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, Ma'am, in point of fact, you told investigators your father never left your sight the entire time you were in Los Angeles. Yes, I said we were together in the entire time. And that was a lie. It wasn't the truth, though. I was a bit embarrassed about sneaking out. Um, so, yes. so you lied about the window of time you were with your father? I lied about sneaking out to the party. I, like I said, I wasn't with him for a Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a few more questions about your father. Uh, your father, Augie Shepard, he works in waste management, is that right? Yeah, he owns his own business. Okay, I, I'd like to talk about the way that, that you live. You, you described your life as a pretty comfortable one, right? Yeah, my dad works hard. You live in a 6,000 square foot gated home. Uh, that sounds about right. Your parents both have luxury vehicles. That's true. You were given a Mercedes Benz at 16 years old. It was a bit much, but yes, that's true. And your brother was also given a Mercedes Benz at 16 years old. Yes, but if you ask me, he didn't quite deserve it. Your father has what you call a small yacht. That's true. And, and, and your father works in waste management? Like I said, yes, he owns his own business. But ma'am, you can't tell us what his job title is, can you? No, not particularly. Ms. Shepard, you can't actually tell us what your father does. No, he doesn't talk about work that much. I mean, let's talk about something that maybe you, you do know about, and that's the trip that you took to Los Angeles. You remember just talking about that with Ms. Shaper. On June 25th and June 26, 2021, when you were in LA, you said that you went out to lunch, right? We did, yeah. And you remember walking through with Ms. Schaefer the way that your eyes moved on the path from lunch to ice cream, right? Yes. I mean, I, I'm more interested just in the path that you took and the time that you took. You walked from lunch to the ice cream shop, right? Yes, we did. You left the lunch place at 1247-ish? That sounds about right. So around 12.50 in the afternoon, you walked by Klein Travel. You remember that? Yes, that's roughly right. And then later, you went back to your hotel. Yes. When you got back to your hotel, <coughs> You were on your computer for a few hours, right? I was. It was actually two and a half to three hours that you were on your computer. Yeah, after the tour, we came back around five, and we headed out for dinner on the During that whole stretch of time, two and a half to three hours, your father was on the phone the whole time. And that's what it looked like. He had his phone in his hand. You remember him talking on the phone for two and a half to three hours? I had headphones in, but I can't tell you if he was talking the entire time. But let's talk about why you had headphones in. Because when you got back, and you got on your computer, and your dad got on your phone, he told you to put headphones on, right? Yes. So you don't know who he was talking to? No, I do Objection, counsel, stuff's fine. Yeah, you heard your honor. Uh, you may. Your honor, it, it's a leading question, but it's, it's not testifying. Based on what this witness has said, she can answer yes or no to that question. If she did know who he was talking to, she can say that. If she didn't, she can say that too. I agree. Overall. Ms. Shepard, you don't know who your father was talking to for three hours. Again, I can't tell you if he was talking the entire time, and I'm not exactly sure who he was talking to. But, but ma'am, just to be very clear, you do remember him being on the phone for three hours. Yes, he was on the phone. I can't tell you who he was talking to. Okay. You also can't tell us what they were talking about. The only thing you can tell us for sure 
is that it was for a stretch of time for about two and a half to three hours. Uh, yes, that's the period of time. Hey, Shepard, I'd like to read something for you and get your thoughts on it. Your Honor, I'm going to be reading from a piece of evidence that's in the record as in full. And Ms. Shepard, actually, if you want to follow along with me through the binder next to you, you can follow along. It's marked Exhibit 4. And I'll be on page 29. You there? Yes. Okay. Ms. Shepard, we're going to line 8 here. Under cellular evidence. Obtained warrant for Augie Shepard's iPhone 12, the phone, and all data associated with the phone. Pausing there for a moment. Augie Shepard, that's your dad, that's his cell phone, right? Uh, yes, that's my dad's cell phone. Okay. No text messages on phone for any time period. Checked call log from 900 hours on June 25th, 2021, to 0400 hours on June 26th, 2021. Pausing there again. That's about the whole stretch of time that you were in Los Angeles. Yes, that's not But during that entire stretch of time, picking up at line 10, phone received one call from wife Carmela Shepard, beginning at 9.03 a.m. on June 25th, lasting three minutes. Phone made one call to wife Carmela, beginning at 5.45 on June 25th, lasting four minutes. Did I read that correctly? That's what it looks like to say. And you know that your dad was on the phone for a whole lot longer than seven minutes that day. Uh, yes, he was on the phone for three hours, not seven minutes. It seems like he was on the phone for the entire Thank you, Ms. Shepard. Nothing further. Redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. May Ms. Shepard be excused? She may. And with that, the defense rests its case. Anything further from either party before we begin with closing? Prosecution is ready to go, Your Honor. All right. As is the defense. You may proceed whenever you're ready. We could have the court's indulgence to set up just a couple things. No problem. Thank you, Your Honor. There's always going to be unanswered questions. Always. 
You've heard some of them throughout this trial. I imagine Ms. Schaefer may remind you of a few of them in just a few minutes. Your job as members of the jury is to hear all the testimony, to see all the evidence, and to examine the totality of the circumstances. So let's walk through those things one at a time. What did you hear in the testimony today? We have heard from two witnesses. The first was a U.S. Deputy Marshal who laid out the evidence that we'll go over in just a minute. The second was the defendant's daughter, Lauren Shepard. When Ms. Shepard took the stand, she told you a couple of interesting things. One, that Barry Capello betrayed their family. He was a family friend. He testified against her father, and it broke her father's heart. She said that her father called him a rat. But the most important part of her testimony is what she couldn't tell us. You see, members of the jury, her presence in court today is fascinating. The only possible utility that Ms. Shepard could provide is an alibi. She was with her father in Los Angeles on that day. She's the only person that could say where he was that night. But she didn't. She tried to at first. When investigators talked to her, she lied. She said, I was with my father that whole night, but she wasn't. The fact of the matter is, she wasn't with her father during the window of opportunity. From 11.30 p.m. to 3 in the morning on June 26, no one knows where the defendant was. That's what you heard. So what did you see? Well, you didn't see just one piece of evidence against this defendant. You heard one after another. Investigator Wright took the stand and told you that there's receipts that were collected that showed that not only was the defendant in Los Angeles, he was at two places on either side of the place where Tom Klein worked. Not only did he walk from one to the other, but in the exact window of time during which he did, the victim seemed to believe they made eye contact. He said, I think they found me. Augie Shepard just walked by my office window and we made eye contact. That's what he said. At the scene, a raft of evidence. There was an eyewitness, members of the jury, who said they saw a dark sports car like the one the defendant was driving, like the one that should have had jumper cables in it, black and red nylac jumper cables, black and red nylac jumper cables like the ones found at the scene and like the ones that weren't in the defendant's car. Physical evidence in the form of impressions in the ground made by shoes, a forensic report which tells us that those shoe impressions were made by somebody wearing size 11 shoes who weighed between 170 to 190 pounds, just like the defendant. That's what you saw. So what do we know when we examine the totality of the circumstances? Because again, members of the jury, you're going to hear questions that you're not quite sure about. And that's true. But the totality of the circumstances shows us that it's not just one thing. The defense wants you to believe that it's just a coincidence that after three years, 1,095 days of living in Los Angeles without any danger, the victim died within 12 hours of seeing Ozzy Shepard. That's just a coincidence. They want you to believe that it's just a coincidence that that car was missing jumper cables that are just inexplicably gone. That's just a coincidence. They want you to believe it's just a coincidence that nobody knows where the defendant was. He was probably sleeping, right? Just a coincidence. At a certain point, it doesn't become reasonable to assume that everything is just a coincidence. But you don't have to. Because it's not any one thing. It's one thing after another. Stacked on top of each other that make a raft of evidence tying this defendant to this crime. That's the totality of the circumstances, and that's the problem with the defense's case. There will always be questions. Your job is to see through them. Your job is to hear the evidence, to look at the evidence, and to examine all of the evidence. When you do that, what you'll see is that Barry Capello was a made man by choice and by chance. And that's what got him killed. And that's why you must find this defendant killed. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor.
Closing from the defense? Yes, Your Honor. down to unanswered questions. If there's one moment from this entire trial I want you to remember and think about right now, it's from the direct examination of Lauren Shepard. I asked her, when you and your father were walking past Pine Travel, that place where Mary Capello was working, did you so much as look through the window? She said, Mr. Crosby asked him, is it possible? Uh, 
someone can find out this information? And he said, yes, it's, it's surely possible. But again, possibilities, that's not enough to meet their burden. That's not enough in a court of law. And Mr. Cosby, he asked Ms. Shepard a lot about this phone call. Uh, <clears throat> he asked about how long it was for, how much she saw of it, how much she heard of it, that she didn't know who it was to. And I'm sure he's going to come up here and he's going to tell you that's the moment he got the address. But if that's what they're arguing, I wonder, why did Mr. Crosby then read to you a portion of that forensic report, Exhibit 4, the cellular evidence to say the phone call didn't take place, that no phone calls were made on that phone at that time? Which one is it? Mr. Crosby gets the last one today. He's going to come up here, he's going to spend a minute of his time, he's going to talk to you and try and tell you he's proven his case, that these questions we've asked, they're just going to be there. But I challenge him to answer these questions, and not just to say so-and-so said it's possible, so we've answered it. No, to bring you evidence, that raft of evidence, bring it. Because right now, they're confident their case is airtight. Confident and convinced they've met their burden, that leaves me with just one final question. Are you, you, members of the jury, have the last word today? So once you think about the evidence that's come out, the questions we've been asking, the answers the government has left missing, we're confident. You'll find all you shepherd not guilty. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any rebuttal from the government? Yes, Your Honor. What do you want to time check again? 13 seconds. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Schaefer asks, how do you explain that the defendant's daughter says her dad never looked at Klein Rental if the victim said, we made eye contact. The explanation is she was lying, like she's done before. Hold the defendant here. Thank you. We'll go ahead and take a few minutes to complete our ballots, and then we'll give you your comments and send you on your way.